And these, of course, were only the first of a series of accomplishments by the Soviet space program. A long list of firsts. First man into orbit. First woman into orbit. First object to be launched from Earth and slam into the lunar surface. First object to perform a soft landing on the lunar surface. First object to reach Mars. A whole list of accomplishments and these accomplishments continue into the present day. Uh, sort of. Okay, Sergey, time to earn your keep. Give us an exact translation. Uh, right, exact translation. Oh, I think the ISS should continue without any further problems. These sanctions should have no impact on the cooperation of our... A uh, Sergey? A exact translation, or we send you right back to Putin. Uh, 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 right. Um, <clears throat> there is also the option of dropping a 500-ton structure to India and China. Do you want to threaten them with such a prospect? The ISS does not fly over Russia, so all the risks are yours. Are you ready for them? Gentlemen, when planning sanctions, check those who generate them for illness. Uh, you, you know that was a very strange sentence. I, I think it could be translated in, I think that President Biden is a real swell Joel. Sergey. So I'm sure after all this time, you folks have become familiar with this particular little joke, quote unquote, that came from the Russians in regards to abandoning our astronaut out in the ISS, separating the two sections of the station, and allowing the American side of the station, and European side for that matter, to descend to, the, to its fate. And even though this may seem like an empty threat to most people, people, it actually isn't, because the thrusters that are necessary to keep the ISS out of danger and away from hazardous debris are on the Russian side of the station. And not only that, the Progress resupply ships also supply the necessary reboost in order to keep the ISS away from hazardous debris. Yes, there are alternatives, but nevertheless, to say that regardless is completely impotent when it comes to threatening to the ISS is an oversimplification, but it is so sad to see that a once magnificent space program has been reduced to this, these vile and horrid threats against the future of mankind's presence in low Earth orbit and beyond because that's all that they are capable of anymore. It's difficult to fathom just how far the mighty have fallen. I mean, think about this. A little over 60 years ago, Yuri Gagarin became the first human being in space. By a long shot, actually. We had no idea that the Soviets were about to accomplish this, and indeed, our effort to send the first man into space became sort of a shadow of what Yuri Gagarin managed to accomplish because the first flight of an American in space was sort of a suborbital flight. Freedom 7 achieved a total flight time of only 15 minutes and 22 seconds. The total flight time, whereas Yuri Gagarin was in orbit for 108 minutes and completed just over one complete orbit of the Earth during his flight. 
quite an accomplishment by way of comparison. Now, later on, of course, our program became much more ambitious, but at the time, it would appear that the Soviets had an enormous lead on the United States, and that lead continued for a considerable period of time. The Luna 1 mission, for example, performed the first successful flyby of the moon. The Luna 2 became the first artifact to reach the moon when it crashed near the Sea of Serenity on September 14, 1959, and later that year, the Luna 3 probe took the first photographs of the far side of the moon, and in 1966, Luna 9 became the first soft landing of an object on the moon, and these were the first photographs taken from the surface of the moon, taken not by Neil Armstrong, but rather from an unmanned Soviet probe. The Soviets were also the first to send living creatures to orbit the moon. The Zond 5 mission, which carried a number of tortoises, two of them actually, and they returned after several days in space orbiting the moon in a confused but very much alive state, something that really is not commonly known these days. So the Soviets may not have put the first human on the moon, but they did put the first First living Earth creatures orbiting the moon. And then, of course, the legendary Alexei Leonov and his first spacewalk in human history. And this, by the way, had its dangerous moments. It was a very risky undertaking, which of course was not admitted at the time, but nevertheless, Leonov, only his skill and training got him successfully back to the capsule before he ran out of life support. So really, this was an extremely dangerous and amazing undertaking by the Soviet space program, another Soviet first, and another achievement of a space program that seemed to have no end to its accomplishments, something that is very difficult to remember today. Instead, tragically, the future of the Russian space program, now called Roscosmos, has been handed over to this guy. And he is far more the politician than he is the space scientist or space visionary. As a matter of fact, it's very difficult to see Rogozin as any sort of visionary. He is a strong nationalist. He fought against Moldova during its breakaway efforts in the early 1990s. He was a very influential politician in an extremist nationalist organization in the early 2000s, an organization that actually became banned from running for election in the Moscow Duma. So there are many things in this man's background to suggest that he would be the worst possible candidate to be heading up an organization that should emphasize international collaboration and cooperation. Instead, during his time at NATO when he was an ambassador there, he made this inflammatory statement about Ukraine and Georgia after they were denied membership in NATO. Quote, they will not invite these bankrupt, scandalous regimes to join NATO, more so as important partnerships with Russia are at stake, unquote. Sort of a prophetic remark mark, really, considering the fact that Russia later went to war with both of these countries when they were conveniently not NATO members. It is so difficult to remember that it was this same organization that put the first rovers on the surface of the moon, Lunacod 1 and 2. These rovers were not only capable of carrying out a variety of scientific tasks on the lunar surface, but also to survive the harshness of the lunar night, surviving off of radioactive isotopes. The first of these rovers managed to survive for an entire year 
appear on the surface of the moon and trundled over 10 kilometers across the lunar surface during the course of its mission. A very impressive achievement, and it was one of only several achievements on the moon, including sample return rovers which were launched on Proton K Block D rockets. So many things that this space agency accomplished on the moon in spite of the fact that they never managed to land a human being there. But they did have rockets that were certainly capable of it later on. And after losing the race to the moon, the Soviets decided that they would achieve their preeminence and dominance in space by establishing a permanent human presence there on a series of space stations. And the Salyut 1 was the first of these. This particular documentary that you're watching right now is about Salyut 7, but many of these space stations were very, very similar. As a matter of fact, the Salyut series bears a tremendous amount of resemblance to some of the modules that are on the Soviet section of the ISS today. The Salyut were an amazing series of space stations, groundbreaking in their design, and like so many other things in the Soviet space program, the first to be deployed. Salyut 1, which was the first manned space station to be placed in orbit, they beat Skylab by about a year or so, was deployed in 1971. The space station was 66 feet long, weighed about 40,620 pounds, and provided 3,500 cubic feet worth of habitable volume, roughly the size of a larger in-ground swimming pool. Not very big, but large enough for the Soviets in any event. However, the first mission, and indeed the only successful mission to this station, ended in tragedy. Soyuz 11 docked with the station successfully after Soyuz 10 failed to do so, and the crew managed to stay on board for a record-breaking 24 days. However, on their return, tragically, there was a sudden depressurization of the Soyuz, and the cosmonauts died. This was the equivalent of the NASA Columbia disaster for the Russian space program, with all three cosmonauts dying in the disaster. And it took quite some time for the Soviets to try again with additional Salyut space stations. The program had some difficulty in deploying additional stations in the future, but to be fair, Skylab was far from an unqualified success as well. But Salyut at 4 was successfully deployed in December of 1974, with much larger solar panels, thus solving many of the station's power issues. But for personal reasons, my favorite version of the Salyut series was Salyut 6, and this is simply because it was the first space station that I ever personally saw as a kid from the roof of my high school, and I must say it was an amazing experience to watch this incredibly bright object, the sun reflecting off of its solar panels as it slowly tracked its way across the sky. I certainly didn't expect to see anything remotely like that when I laid eyes on Salyut 6, and also to consider all of this thing, all of the things rather that this station accomplished, well, it's beyond impressive. These, this next generation generation series of space stations, starting with Salyut 6, added additional docking ports that allowed them to be resupplied by uncrewed progress cargo vehicles. What that meant is you could extend the stays, or rather the missions, of these cosmonauts on board by a considerable amount of time. For example, the first long-duration crew on Salyut 6 stayed for 96 days, beating the 84-day world record for space endurance established in 1974 by the last Skylab crew. But Salyut 6 went on to much bigger and better things. Salyut 6 had a total of six resident crews, the first of which arrived on the 10th of December in 1977. That was the one that stayed for 96 days. Then, on the 15th of June in 1978, another crew arrived 
arrived for a 140-day endurance mission. After that, in February of 1979, that mission went on for 175 days. After that, April 9th, 1980, that particular mission lasted for 185 days. There was a repair mission that lasted approximately 12 days, and then the final resident crew stayed for 75 days in March of 1981. And by the way, that was when I saw Salyut 6 for that last mission. But as I mentioned before, what made Salyut 6 truly special was its ability to be resupplied. This allowed crews to stay for an incredibly long period of time, but it also allowed for additional crews to be carried up to the station. There were 10 visiting crews in addition to the resident crews, and these came from all over the world. Granted, all of these countries were part of the Soviet bloc, communist nations, if you will, but still, it was the first international space station, with cosmonauts from Hungary, Poland, Romania, Cuba, Mongolia, Vietnam, and East Germany, and 12 Progress freighters delivered more than 20 tons of equipment, supplies, and fuel during this time. Salyut 6 was an unbelievable breakthrough in space station logistics and technology, some thing that really was carried forward into the ISS. Without this station, everything that's been accomplished by the ISS during its duration in orbit would simply not be possible. Now granted, while Salyut 6 was completing its final missions, we were beginning to deploy the space shuttle and all of the amazing things that it accomplished, and I'm not taking anything away from what NASA was able to do during that time. But as a teenager in that particular era, it was the Soviets who seemed to be really trying to establish a permanent human presence in space with long-duration missions that made our space shuttle missions seem like brief excursions out into space that really couldn't last very long. Without a space station to support it, the space shuttle could only accomplish so much compared to what the Soviet space program could accomplish during months and months on a space station. We also needed a space station, one that was supposed to be called Freedom, but it was never completed, not without the assistance of other other governments, including later on the Russians. And if it was not for Salyut 6 and the stations that preceded it, the ISS would have been far more difficult to complete. And although it's impossible to cover all of the accomplishments of the Soviet space program in a single video, I would be seriously remiss if I didn't talk about this amazing rocket, the Energia. This was the pinnacle of Soviet accomplishments and it would have carried them to unbelievable destinations if it had been allowed to mature. But unfortunately, this rocket came into existence very close to the time when the Soviet Union fell into decay and collapse, which was a huge tragedy because this rocket was definitely capable of taking us back to the moon. Its cargo capacity was 100 metric tons, to low Earth orbit and 20 metric tons all the way to translunar injection orbit. It certainly could carry a variety of different types of craft into lunar space and perhaps even to land on the moon if it was designed for it. If we still have these sorts of rockets at our disposal today, the SLS would frankly be unnecessary. This is something that my Uncle George talked to me about at length when we talked about going back to the moon in the 1990s. As many of you know, it was this rocket that carried the Soviet version of the space shuttle into orbit for its only flight on November 15th of 1988. Unlike the space shuttle, this had four boosters instead of two. For a total thrust of 6,500,000 pounds at sea level, or 7.2 million pounds of thrust in a vacuum. And the core stage had 1.3 million 
million pounds of thrust at sea level powered by four RD0120 engines and seven or one million seven hundred thousand pounds worth of thrust in a vacuum, which means combined in a vacuum, this thing had a thrust of nearly nine million pounds, more than that of the SLS. This rocket could have changed everything for the future of space flight, but instead it took the Buran up once and then it landed and that was it. And the Energia faded into oblivion. And so, in my opinion, it did the Russian space program. Slowly but surely, the Russian space program has decayed ever since as a result of underfunding, as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and and as the result of corruption. The triumph and tragedy of the Soviet space program is one of the most amazing and one of the saddest epics in the history of space flight. I really can't think of anything else that could have been more disappointing. This vessel not only had the same sort of reusability that the shuttle had, but the final iteration, the final design of this ship was complete reusability. The ability for all of the boosters and everything else associated with it to return to base safely to be reused. This actually was what Elon Musk had in mind from the beginning. If this could have been accomplished, the Soviet space program could have achieved complete reusability just as the Starship hopes to accomplish way back before the beginning of the 21st century. At the very least, the Energia, if we had worked in conjunction with the Soviets at the time could have taken us back to the moon. But instead, this rocket performed two launches, one of which was a glorious success, and then the entire program fell into ignominious collapse. It's amazing that the Russian space program was able to continue at all. And yes, it was allow, did allow us rather to travel to the ISS for 10 years while the space shuttle was put out of action. The Soyuz provided reliable rides up to the ISS, demonstrating the reliability of the Soviet space program and the products that they produce. The RD-1 180 engine, which powers the Atlas V, has proven to be one of the best rocket engines in human history. I challenge you to find one that's any better. The Merlin, perhaps just as good, but it would be very hard to find one that's any more reliable than the RD-180 engine. So many solid accomplishments from this organization, and yet now it's been put into the hands of a tasteless maniac who seems to only have a talent for spewing idiocies on Twitter. And not only that, he had an opportunity to open up the doors of diplomacy to maintain a relationship between the United States and Europe and Russia through the space program because even though our governments were enemies, our scientists, our space programs did not have to be enemies and yet that is not what happened, quite the opposite. And this is why Rogozin is the greatest embarrassment and it horrible, horrible symbol of the utter collapse of the Russian space program. To me, this man's statements are a revolting antithesis to an amazing quote that was made by Yuri Gagarin while he was in orbit. Quote, Orbiting Earth in the spaceship, I saw how beautiful our planet is. People, let us preserve and increase this beauty, not destroy it. Do you suppose that this man would approve of what's happening right now? Do you think that he would approve of this sort of wanton aggression while the space program of this nation collapses and dissolves? I think not. Let us hope that one day Russia has leadership that embraces the ideas and vision of men like Yuri Gagarin rather than the views of people like Rogozin and Putin. If you like 
like what I have to say, if you enjoy this content, please subscribe to my channel and check out the description. There are many ways to support me there as well. So until the Russian space program actually has leadership that is worthy of the experience and the accomplishment of the many, many men and women who have led this nation and this space program to unbelievable accomplishments in the past. Until one day they are worthy of these people's legacy, and I believe one day they can be. Until this happens, I urge all of you to stay angry about space!